This is C12, episode 3, recorded April 6th, The Dinosaur in the Classroom. Well, welcome on April 6th. This is the third episode of C12. Uh, welcome back to those of you who have uh, been keeping keeping up with uh, our new show. And uh, welcome to the, those of you who are here for the first time. And uh, this is our uh, new show on EduQuest focused on K-12 education and uh, the, the various issues and stories uh, that, uh, that are, are, are hitting our students and our teachers, uh, hopefully with the goal of, of giving you some, some tools and information that you can take back to the classroom with you right away and take into your professional learning and, uh, and even uh, the students can take with them as they, as they head home and head off into the world. Our uh, episode this week is brought to us by Hello Hello, and uh, you can find them at hellohello.com. So thank you to our sponsor. So I want to start with a, an article uh, that was it's, it's, the CNN has been following this. A number of, of blogs have been following it. Uh, there are uh, there were a number of words that, that New York State uh, actually they published a list of words uh, that they plan to remove from standardized tests that were that are uh, used in the state. Uh, it's kind of a, a strange list. Uh, it includes everything from dinosaur to religion uh, to to birthday. Um, you know, these things have have implications in in various uh, you know, various religions, uh, various cultures, um, and and obviously New York, particularly containing New York City, uh, has a, a very heterogeneous population to which New York State is trying to be sensitive. Um, New York State also includes some extremely rural, fairly conservative areas uh, up in up in you know, up into New England, and uh, so there was an attempt to be sensitive to that. Uh, it, it seemed to me misguided. Uh, from the get-go, and in fact, uh, the the outcry over kind of the the ridiculousness of it uh, has led New York State to to pull back, um, and uh, and so the Department of Education said, never mind, we're not going to ban these words. Instead, we'll just ask people to be sensitive in their test development, which makes sense. I, can't imagine why why we need to go much further than that. Uh, you know, particularly in terms of, of legislating uh, the removal of, of really quite quite benign words. Uh, so uh, glad to see that that has uh, been put to bed. Uh, obviously, you know, um, yeah, I think we most of us uh, who've taken you know a standardized test in the last twenty years uh, know that there's always a uh, you know multicultural examples given, and those those math word problems always include uh, an appropriate mix of of uh, people of, uh, with you know, different names, different cultures, that's all well and good, and, and it's fine to make these things relevant for uh, the folks who have to take the tests. Um, but uh, keeping the word dinosaur out, well, oh, okay. Which uh, which actually leads quite nicely into our next story. Um, this was just uh, featured on the Wall Street Journal uh, online, and uh, Tennessee now is is the latest state uh, here in, in the U.S. to be looking at uh, some legislation allowing the discussion of creationism, uh, of intelligent design, and of the, the various things uh, that can cause any number of, of you know, sorts of controversies uh, among parents, school boards, and uh, all the stakeholders in education. Uh, you know, th- this is something that has, been, has come up over and over and over again. And uh, you know we hear it, uh, you know, particularly in conservative states here in the U.S., but uh, you know, in in uh, you know, in countries around the world, um, particularly those uh, which tend to uh, have uh, you know a little, little, little more religion injected into their governments and into their cultures. Uh, certainly, there's there's going to be um, hot button topics that are a struggle. To, to educate around. You know, when we're talking about the theory of evolution in class, uh, you're going to have students who have questions and who, who genuinely believe that it isn't true and uh, who will point out that it's not called the theory for nothing. Uh, this bill seeks to open up uh, classrooms to discussion. And, and some, some of the wording is, uh, it, it sounds benign uh, in that, you know, 
allowing teachers to have discussions about alternative theories. Now, it seems like that's actually a reasonable thing in class. I think most classrooms do uh, address uh, at least um, you know, student questions, and uh, with, with the emphasis being on, on the science and, and all the evidence that we have today. Um, the ACLU, obviously, is, is concerned about this. Teachers' unions, in fact, are concerned uh, about this. Um, the, the scientific community, uh, the last thing uh, you know, they believe that we need is, is the teaching of, of more unscience. Um, I think that the real concern is that uh, basically this is going to s open up a, a pretty slippery slope. You know, where do you stop a, a discussion of alternative viewpoints and, and turn into actually teaching uh, creationism, for example, or intelligent design? Uh, the, the legislation also specifically calls out uh, things like global warming. Uh, which they refer to as as a theory uh, and and one that is potentially untrue, um, even though you know we have have countless bits of evidence, uh, not just bits, but but really quite significant evidence that the climate change is, is a real issue. Uh, it's it, it's uh, that that idea though of the slippery slope that that's where this really starts to go awry, and um, it's the place where uh, we could certainly envision. Uh, teachers, parents, students, um, kind of derailing what is a, a well-established science curriculum and, and what is um, you know, well-established science. Uh, we have lots and lots and lots of, of very concrete evidence for, for all these things that they get taught uh, and that yet still have detractors. Um, I think some recent statistics suggest that in the United States, there's, there's a, a significant percentage. I don't have that number on the top of my head, but we're talking on the order of 15 to 20 percent uh, of people in this country uh, who, who do not believe that, that evolution actually took place. Um, and obviously people are entitled to their beliefs, but, but this, this mixing of, of religion with an actual science curriculum in schools is, is troubling at best, and, and this is what um, the various opposition groups are, uh, are, are calling out. Uh, it looks as though this is going to pass in a, a, a fairly conservative state with a fairly conservative legislature, and uh, and it's headed for court. So we'll see uh, if it if it does make it. It'll certainly make it up sure, to to the state high courts. Uh, if it makes it up to the Supreme Court in the United States, which it, it may very well, uh, this is a uh, this will be a landmark case, and and it will be an important piece of of, of defining uh, case 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 work, uh, and. Uh, yeah, this this is an issue that has been uh, rearing its ugly head in schools for a very long time, and uh, I, I can't imagine this will put it to bed. But perhaps as it makes its way through the legal process, uh, we can see a bit of bit of resolution to it. Hopefully, the resolution is is one that favors science over unscience. We will see. Uh, there is a, a new bill in Arizona uh, talking about cyber cyberbullying, which is a, a, an, an issue that absolutely must be addressed. Uh, it is not something that um, it's it is not something that that needs to be overlooked or we can bury our heads in the sand. Uh, you know, we can do lots of things to try and have really positive climates in the schools and limit bullying while students are are on premise. Uh, but uh, but but when they're at home, when they're on the internet, when they are um, out of school, where does the schools or, or the states, in fact, where does their their reach extend, and and how much can a student be uh, be punished uh, for things that they do out of school, online, you know, in in, in ways that that you know, schools traditionally have not had much reach. Uh, most experts agree that if things are happening online or out of school, um, if they are affecting the learning process, and this is this goes back to, to a fair amount of free speech, uh, you know, casework and, and legislation, uh, if it's affecting things that happen in school, then it's school business. And so if a student is intimidating and bullying another student online, uh, then then free speech laws uh, dictate that if that substantially affects the classroom environment, uh, then it's, it, it is not protected and, and uh, schools have the right to, uh, to take action. <sighs> the Arizona bill, however, uh, definitely is, uh, is, is a bit further reaching and free speech advocates are, are up in arms and, and I think for good reason and, and, and I hate the idea that uh, these things are, are getting clouded by the, you know, the actual issue of bullying and cyberbullying is being clouded uh, by uh, something that is, is 
such a, an overreaching bill that really affects free speech that, that now we aren't able to address bullying in, in, a, in a reasonable way. Let me just read a, a section, though, of the, the amended bill. Uh, that, that's making its way through the Arizona House right now. It is unlawful for any person with intent to terrify, intimidate, threaten, harass, annoy, or offend to use any electronic or digital device and use any obscene, lewd, or profane language to suggest any lewd or lascivious act or threaten to inflict physical harm on the person or property of any person. It's also unlawful to otherwise disturb by repeated, anonymous, electronic, or digital communications the peace, quiet, or right of privacy of any person at the place where communications were received. Wow, um, that's uh, that 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 covers a whole lot of interactions, and uh, it, it, it you know, read quite literally. I'm looking at, at the letter of the law. Um, we can't have students swearing on Facebook anymore. We can't have students sending a, a text with a, a, a curse in it, uh, or um, you know, and, and and just how do you define? Harassment. Uh, I'm not saying that students should be harassing each other uh, on their their phones or on the internet, uh, on on the on a tablet device where they they send a tweet. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I, obviously, our intent here, the intent is to uh, ensure that, that students aren't. You know, we've had some very high profile suicides here in the state of, of Massachusetts. Um, there have been some very high profile cases of, of students killing themselves because of of significant bullying, both in and out of school. And obviously, we need to do something to help protect our students and, and promote reasonable climates. But uh, to, to take this to this level where we are, are really infringing on the, the rights of students to communicate in, in ways that are, are uh, somewhat natural, uh, I think this steps way beyond um, trying to limit bullying and, and starts getting into some, some scary free speech implications. So. Um, uh, if, you, if you live in Arizona, now is the time to contact your uh, your your legislator, uh, but it's also time worldwide for us to really be thinking about a framework uh, for, for keeping students safe, making them feel welcome and included, and, and for making sure that, that schools are a place for learning and not a place of, of torture. You know, there are an awful lot of times when um, students don't have no desire to, students don't want to go to school often anyway, um, when they are really, really, uh, when they really struggle with their peers. And to find that the school is, is not a safe place, um, that there, there's nothing that interferes with learning more. And, and so as, as a result of that, we, we, need, we need a framework that is better than anything we have out there right now, because none of them are terribly effective and, and most are, are somewhat arbitrary. Uh, we need a framework for, for really helping students interact with each other appropriately, um, behave as, as very reasonable digital citizens, and, and, and we've, we've even heard, we heard the same thing from, from Charlie Osborne uh, in, our, in our conversation. She, of course, was talking about uh, just our digital footprint, but, but digital citizenry is something we need to be teaching, and, and personal, interpersonal interactions, um, both in a, in a professional and reasonable manner, they all need to be part of, of what we teach and, and how we work in the classroom. Do we need to make sure that no student ever sends a curse word uh, from their mobile phone? Probably not. So we we will see where this where this goes, uh, but uh, this is this is this is not the way to solve bullying. And uh, uh, bullying has been going on for uh, well probably many thousands of years. Uh, there's there's got to be a, a better way, whether we're, whether it's digital or otherwise. Uh, there needs to be a better way in a modern society to to deal with the way that we interact with each other. So one other article I wanted to highlight uh, is there's a, an article on All Things D, uh, why tablets in the classroom could save schools $3 billion a year. And, you know, I, I, that, that's a big number. It's a very big number. It's, it's a fraction of what we spend on various bits of education. Um, but I don't think this number is actually out of whack. And, 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 I, and obviously, it's, it's a group of publishers and technology companies who are, are talking about it. Um, but you know the, the the idea is is as as you know Peter Kafka points out in all things D you know digitizing classrooms is a good idea um, that's that's the, the 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 premise of this um, but uh, you know unfortunately I think what we're seeing and, and we've certainly seen it with, with Apple's uh, iBooks um, we've seen it with publishers who are really not doing anything in terms of, of DRM. Um, we aren't seeing them do anything smart in terms of, of how they get content, digital content, to schools and to students. Um, 
we're not seeing prices come down on digital text for that much versus uh, versus the um, you know, traditional dead paper text, uh, even though obviously distribution costs go down to to nothing, development costs go down, publishing and printing costs go down. Um, you know, all these things. You know, we know that they're saving a lot of money, and they're simply just making more money on what should be a new model of distribution. So, uh, you know, I, I mean, Peter Kafka, you know, as he says. Um, you know, let, let's say for argument's sake that digitizing classrooms is a good thing. Um, it's it, it, that's true, but not because doing so is going to save schools money anytime soon. And certainly, with our current model of doing things and of, of distributing content, of, of using mainstream content from the big publishers, um, it, it, it certainly doesn't seem to be saving anything. Then, of course, there's the initial outlay of, of uh, capital for the devices themselves. Um, that being said. You know, let's let's take a step back and let's think about how we could hit that three billion number or a bigger number, and I think we can. And and, and here's how: so we can get price points down on tablets and computing devices when we can make sure that equity uh, we have equity in terms of who has access to these devices and 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 how uh, students can actually get the content, whatever that content might be. Uh, then all of a sudden we start thinking about making use of the wide variety of resources we have out there, and uh, you know, Kristen Winkler and I have talked about this on on review ad ad, ad nauseum, and then with good reason because it's so critical. Uh, and, and Audrey Waters talks about the same thing. Um, you know, the idea of the textbook is very much an anachronism, and there's huge amounts of, of wonderful, rich information available on the internet, direct from subject matter experts, uh, that teachers can now curate. And 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 this this you know the, I think. Curate is the word of, of the year, uh, and that's okay. It should be because we are nearly overwhelmed by information and by uh, by teaching resources that are online uh, and that are, are available digitally. Many of which are available for free or are very you know very low cost. Uh, the teacher, as a subject matter expert, has to be able to pull these things together and share them with students. And when that can begin happening, when tablets are inexpensive, when students can access the internet and access. Uh, these resources online, and when teachers are, are willing to step back from sort of traditional textbook classroom models and start pulling information together, sharing with their students, getting students to to share and synthesize and and put extra information back out there. Uh, you know, we've talked about this, you know, with with Mentor Mob last week, uh, and and I just talked about them. Uh, I talked with Vince Leung of, of Mentor Mob on on WizIQ during one of, you know one of WizIQ conversations. Um, you know, when when students start creating their own content based on these open resources and are synthesizing and sharing and discussing and collaborating to produce this, okay, now all of a sudden we can start thinking about just how much a tablet or a computing device of any sort can save a school. When it's the same old, same old, and it just happens to be on the screen instead of a book, well, your backpack's going to be lighter, uh, but your budget and your bottom line certainly will not be. And uh, as things stand, you know, uh, we talked uh, recently about you know, Apple iBooks and, and how, in fact, it's going to be quite drastically increasing costs for schools. This is the opposite of what's supposed to be happening uh, with digital content, with digital books, uh, with, with, the, with the promise of tablets. Uh, it's, it's, it's time for, for a shift. So um, we, we will see. I absolutely agree with, with uh, Mr. Kafka that, uh, in fact, you know, unfortunately, this isn't going to happen anytime soon. Uh, but the technology is already there. The content is already almost there. Uh, the biggest thing we have to change now to, to see these savings happen uh, is, is changing the pedagogy and changing the mindset on the use of content of uh, the sort. So um, we've got a ways to go, I think. But, uh, but the potential is there. Huge savings to be had. Different model, very much needed. Once again, take a, a few moments to... Uh, Mention our sponsor, very much appreciated. Uh, our sponsor this week uh, for C12 is Hello Hello. Uh, Hello Hello is an innovative language learning company that offers state of the art online mobile courses. And Hello Hello couples social networking with language learning, which allows users to interact with native speakers around the world right from their mobile devices. Uh, Hello Hello offers courses in 11 different languages for the iPad, iPhone, and Android devices. And they actually just launched a new range of apps for the Blackberry Playbook. So the courses have been developed in collaboration with the American Council on the Teaching of Foreign Language, and you can visit them at hellohello.com. That's hello-hello.com.
So welcome to uh, the latest episode of C12. I am joined by Stefan Stevenson of Minguville, and we are going to be chatting today about their newly out of beta uh, math curriculum for younger grades, as well as their English language learning curricula. And uh, very happy to have you here. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. So why don't we just start uh, by you giving me a little bit of background on these these sort of two parallel products. I know you've done a, a huge amount of work in Denmark, uh, but it uh, looks like things are, are really kind of coming together for uh, North American audiences as well. Yes, I mean, for our English learning program, we've worked uh, pretty much around the world for, for many years with uh, a couple of millions of users, uh, with all kinds of both to schools, to governments, Right now, we're testing it in kindergartens in, in Vietnam. So with the English program, we're pretty much around the world. But for our math programs, which we have designed for the Danish curricula, which is actually from the first to ninth grade, that has been very successful in Denmark. Uh, I think 30% of all schools is now using this in, the, in school hours. And uh, we have recently launched some, uh, some apps for Android and iOS as well. And they have been downloaded now equivalent to 16% of all kids in Denmark now have our apps. So it has been quite successful. And we thought that, well, maybe this method can be, uh, could be used in the U.S. as well. So, so, so what's, what's unique about, about the method, to, about what you're bringing to, um, to, to the, the instructional landscape? Well, well, we still, I mean, we have one, you could say, uh, uh, philosophy, which is very important when, when we go into this. The first thing is that we want to make sure that this is not an analogist textbook that we put online. So, of course, you, you go into a universe where you follow some, some uh, kind of, either it's, uh, in, in, in Mingoville, the English program, it's some flamingos. In this math program, it is some monsters on an island. And they all have real voice actors that are speaking. So, so we, we use dialogue based communication. It's verbal communication. And we not only do training, typical math you find online is a lot of exercises where you train something, but we also think it's very important that the learning aspect comes in. So we actually also explain you different topics in small animation videos. Wow. So that's, that's a big difference, I would say. Right. Well, I think that that's so critical. I mean, so much of what we do see is just this very quick translation to something online or, or to something you know mildly interactive, and all of a sudden we have an interactive textbook. Um, you know, one thing, one thing I noticed as I as I poked around your your sites and, and your apps is that there are things specifically designed for interactive whiteboards, and and so often those those interactive whiteboards, especially at the younger grades, where the teachers may not have the, the professional development yet to really use them in in smart ways. Uh, no no pun intended. Uh, you know, they they tend to be just glorified whiteboards. They're, they're the whiteboards that, that aren't caked with with years of of dry erase marker or that that aren't chalk boards for that matter. So, you know, I, 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 tell me a little bit about, uh, say, what a, a typical lesson might look like using an interactive whiteboard to, to do some of the math instruction in the early grades. Well, I mean, actually, in Denmark also, whiteboard has been become very popular. We see whiteboards on almost every second classroom now, and uh, there's no doubt about, again, they're not used as intended. Most of them just use them for the projector. Uh, right. So... We've been doing a lot of workshops for teachers to say, how could you use the whiteboards also as a way of showing these kind of things? And we found, and this was not intended by us, but this is feedback from teachers, and we now use that as a case, that our instructional small animation videos or uh, animation of explaining the topic, the, the teacher uses those to say, all right, we're going to start a new topic now, class, and... We're going to use this, uh, you know, computer-based learning program, but to give you an idea about what it's all about and to give you an introduction to a new topic, let's say it's uh, subtraction. Then they will start the first uh, hour in the classroom where they will use our small animation video and show that in the classroom. And we put some small stops in this animation so the teacher, they, they kind of control the progress, how fast they want to go. But this way, the teacher can stand with the front to the classroom instead of standing with the back to the whiteboard and drawing, and all of a sudden she loses her 25 kids uh, in her back that are doing something else. So it's a, it's a tool for them actually to stand there and 
the storytelling a teacher normally does, which a good teacher does at least, is that we kind of also try to take that over, but of course we still want the teacher in, and they can be the facilitator between what's going on on the smart board here together with the kids and let them ask the nice questions to the kids. Gotcha. Now you also have, have apps as well. So how are, are you seeing adoption pretty much you know, on a teacher level, so they're, they're working with the apps, or are students in one-to-one uh, programs using, using apps? How, how is that being deployed generally with the younger grades? Uh, first of all, I'll say very differently. Okay. Um, the, the first thing we, we saw that the good thing about the apps is we can take them into the classroom. So, so we don't have to go down to some room where you have some computers. So it can be a mix that first you do something together as a normal classroom teacher and the teacher can say, and when the teacher does, uh, really quickly you become the hero saying, please take out your, mo- your, your smartphones or your mobile phones, which is always a good thing. But here we have actually made some different kind of apps where some you can sit and do one by one. We have some where you can hook up. So you might sit with your Android phone and I sit with my iPad. And I can quickly say, let's say we learn subtraction now and I give you some exercises. We can, you and I can connect by just typing in the same three digits. And then we play against each other. So we have some, you could say, uh, quickly we'll have a little bit of, uh, Competition, competition here involved, which is which is fun when it's when it's, when it's about math. Right. The other thing we have done is we have made some small kind of quizzes, which works extremely well on phones as well. Where you 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 put your you put your phone down. I can actually, I mean, I can almost explain you here, show you here. This is a uh, first grade, uh, my first grade app. Uh, I think you can see it here. Yeah, I I, I log in, and and why I want to just show you this is because one of these small games in here is a quiz, right? So I have some of them as a quiz. This is a quiz about mirroring things. But I can play up to four players. So let's say it's you and I playing this, or the three of us here sitting there. I put this, three players, I put it between us, and it says, okay, here's player one, this is player two, this is player three. So it it becomes a game board with also a, a, a little result panel. And I just spin the bottle, and who gets the quiz? The next question was, oh, play three, that's me. And now I get the question is, choose the correct mirrored image down here. And I just go here, no, is this correct? Wow. No. Yeah, that's the one. Oh, no, that was not the one. And I got now one wrong, and we go again. Who gets the next question? So what we found, what was really interesting here was, when we tried to do this, I mean, everybody knows the gameplay, spin the bottle. Not, right. not new here. But if you did this in the old-fashioned way with a real bottle as in questions, as soon as the bottle hit me, you would be doing something else because you're like, oh, I got free. It didn't, you know, it, I was not here. But with this, we see that the kids all of a sudden actually discuss things. They, they, they lean over the table, look at it, and say, no, that's not mirrored correctly because, and they start using math terms because they have to explain to each other why they don't think this uh, image was mirrored correctly. And, and that's pretty interesting uh, way of how they communicate. That also means you can have one smartphone just, uh, and you can have that used for four kids. You don't have to have one per Right, true one-to-one. Right. So, you know, it's funny because Intel has done a lot of research on this idea of micromobility and, and, and how kids respond to the, the idea that they can take this thing with them and they go huddle in a group somewhere and they work. And they work far differently than they would if they had books to take somewhere or they're sitting in, in, in rows, you know, yeah. in the, the, this perfect classroom. And, and this absolutely lends itself to that. What a great idea. So, so this is why we have seen that, that the feedback we get is very, very different. It, mean, it really means that the teachers, some of them, they see it works perfectly for that. A lot of uh, where you have small teams where, where some students that needs, you could say, extracurricular activities or need extra special help where you, where you are in small groups, I mean, they, they really spend a, a lot of time on our products because it's easy for, the, for that one teacher to sit and, and be part of them. So they have a discussion over, you could say, a tablet instead of uh, me in front of the, 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 the normal blackboard and you as students. All of a sudden, we sit together in a group and we're all equal. So nice. it, it puts down some barriers as well. Are those apps, how many of those apps are available in English? Well, uh, Right now, we have uh, made our, uh, the, the, the first app we've made here for English is um, math for first, second, and third graders. 
I think that you go in the app store that just called uh, Learn Math One, Learn Math Two, Learn Math Three in the in the app store. And uh, I mean they've been number one educational apps in Denmark for a long time. So uh, I hope, of course, uh, eventually they will uh, they will move up in in the U.S. market as well. I hope so too, because I mean it's 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 very hard, I think, to find things that are, are really pedagogically sound in terms of of these apps. There's lots of people who have thrown things together because uh, you know education is hot right now, and and you know we we should all have tablets, and every kid should have an iPad, uh, as opposed to having something that's really well thought out and well researched. So um, this is great, and and uh, just to to note, you know, that there. Are, in your documents and on your site, you do outline where things are um, aligned to the co- the Common Core here in the states, and and so teachers can can follow that along. Yeah, I mean, we we have made a, a U.S. website for for the American version, which is called Mondizo dot com, and there you can go in and read about it and and see how it's measured to the Common Core. Uh, you can see small example pictures of the different things. So um, so that's that should be available. Oh, absolutely, and we'll we'll put that up on our up on you know the 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 lower lower third as uh, so if I have to mention one more uh, if we talk apps and what is really interesting because this yeah. was actually something we found out in math classes that a lot of kids nowadays they don't know how to tell time on an analog clock because if you ask a kid nowadays and you ask what time is it they'll take out their mobile phone and they'll go oh it's fifteen forty eight it's three forty eight and they don't know <laughs> they don't know that's a quarter to four you know uh, because they cannot. They don't know the analog clock, and in many schools and on public places, we still have analog clocks. But we have a whole generation who grew up who don't know the analog clock. So we thought there must be room for making a, an app that could do this, <laughs> and and we did this in 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 in, in Danish. And this has been in the top top uh, paid iPad apps, ten iPad apps in three months in Denmark. Number one in education in Denmark. Now it's in Norway. Number one. And and uh, we've made it also so so it's uh, available in in, uh, in English and it's also about storytelling with a real voice actor. This comes in here. Oh, sorry, he speaks uh, Chinese here. Uh, so you can you can you can go in and change change the language here. So it's not Chinese, but it should be English or U.S. Now you'll have. It. Hi there. And, to playtime on your and the whole idea is you have to build your own clock and really play with it. So here you go in and and uh, and, and, and play with the clock and build it yourself without falling apart. So you use the the you know you go like this and it, it all moves around. You then have to build build the clock yourself. And Wonderful. they will learn minutes and five minutes and all that as a, in, in a progress. But again, just like I talked before about the difference between learning and training, this is training as well. So if you haven't had somebody to tr- learn you, you can actually go in and watch the video. So I want to see, I want to watch the video here, stream it or download it. And now I'll watch a video where it explains to me about this is the big hand, this is the small hand in a dialogue. What time is it? Wonderful. And, and, you know, it's funny because... I th- the people don't realize, you know, how critically important this can be to learning fractions as well. I think people have such a poor understanding of, of fractions generally and the ability to manipulate them, and yet this is a foundation uh, for for teaching the use of fractions. So another great application. We, we had a quite good feedback here. I had a, a parent that, that not just wrote me, that called me and said he just wanted to let me know that he spent some months trying to teach his kids the, the, the clock. And he was sitting, you know, with his finger over this watch here, and nobody could see what he was doing. And he downloaded the app, and he said, what I've spent some months on, it took my kid, which was five years old, two days, and he could tell the time all over. I mean, perfectly. Right, without a show. And That's it has been fun for us as a, as a learning company, because people always ask us, well, this uh, digital education doesn't work. And I'm, you know, I'm trying to teach English and math. And... To measure if it works is uh, a science. Uh, it would, you know, to, to make a proof will take a long time. So when you go into a very small topic like learn how to tell time, it has been quite fun to see, well, we tested this, it works, and it works in a very short time frame. Right, very so that, That's why it's been so interesting for us to actually do this as well. 
Excellent, excellent. I think you know. Honestly, I think this is a a model uh, of what uh, iPad and, and tablet apps should be should be looking like in schools. That, you know, so often you, you don't see them taking full advantage of of the accelerometer and and the you know the, the swipes and, and the gestures uh, to to really do something that's totally natural for for our students because it's not students who design it. It's old people who uh, you know like us who yeah. you know didn't <laughs> grow up with with touch. And yeah. uh, but uh, you you've nailed it. So very good. Well, I'll be. Uh, I, very much looking forward to actually downloading some of this stuff myself and turn my kids loose on it. And, uh, and uh, I really appreciate you taking some time today. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Hope to see you again. It's a pleasure. Talk to, talk to you soon. Bye. Welcome. I, uh, it's it's the, the latest review of the week in epi- or uh, blog of the week in episode number three of uh, C12. I'm joined today by Charlie Osborne, who is a colleague of mine over at ZDNet. She writes the I Generation column and uh, is is pretty much our, our our voice for the millennials over there. And uh, she actually wrote a great piece, though she has. Uh, all sorts of good stuff that comes up uh, on on learning and education. Obviously, a pretty critical thing for uh, for Gen Y because many of them are, are still in school, whether they're in uh, you know high school, uh, you know kind of the trailing edge of, of Gen Y uh, in college, or they're just stepping out into the job market. Um, they're still pretty deeply immersed in the world of education, and so Charlie brings uh, some some great perspectives to that. I uh, just wanted to, uh, Charlie, have you introduce yourself a little bit more than, than I did. Tell us a, a bit about what you bring to the table, and then we'll, we'll talk about your, your blog on, on you know, memorization uh, and, and uh, sort of rote versus understanding uh, in modern education. Sure, Chris. Um, yep, so my name's Charlie. Uh, I'm 24, and I currently live in London. Um, now, my background is actually from teaching, so I come at it from as much as I can from a sort of on-the-ground perspective when I write about things like this. Um, because obviously I'm in both groups. I'm, all, I'm Gen Y in one way, but I've also taught Gen Y, as well as teaching people younger and far more older than me, uh, you know, going up to 65 years old in Saudi Arabia, which was a quite an interesting experience, you have to say. <laughs> <I'm> um, <sure. laughs> yeah, it was an interesting one. Um, I've also worked in business. I've done service. Um, I've taught in about 22 countries, I think, and counting. Um, so, yeah, a bit of a spotted past, really. And my latest job is working, as you said, at ZDNet and also this is a site, Smart Planet. Wonderful. And you're only 24? You've been busy. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> so everyone says. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, well, why don't you just summarize your, your post on, on ZDNet for us, and we'll include a, a link for the audience, but just to uh, summarize your post, and, and then we'll, we'll, we'll chat a little bit about the ideas, but I think you, you hit on some, some really important points, and, and I wanted to just bring them to light. Sure. Um, the, the title of the post is called The Future of Education, Memorize and Analyze, and it's basically looking at how teaching methods, how current uh, Pedagogy. I can't even say it. Pedagogy. Is it pedagogy. I never I got pe- that right. I would say pedagogy and and and. Yeah, but you're American. That's what exactly. That's right. so, <laughs> and, and, and usually, East Coast people say pedagogy, and West Coast people like me say say pedagogy. So I don't know, but we know what you mean. Pedagogy. We'll go with that. One. <laughs> um, but basically, how it fits in with what um, the future in the global economy will actually expect students who are entering the workforce to be able to do. Um, and what I, gen- what I basically say in the article is that we're failing our students, pretty much. Um, <laughs> and the emphasis on how we do it is we're emphasizing on memorize- uh, memorizing data. But the thing is that we're in a data saturated environment. So what is the point? It's just absolute wasted time, wasted energy. And it's, you know, it's almost archaic now. You know, if you ask kids to memorize X, Y, and Z, well, they can look it up on Google at any point. They've all got mobile phones, they've all got tablets, they've all got this, that, and the other. Um, and it just seems an absolute waste for me that these kids are leaving school in an already tempestuous job market, and they're not being equipped with the right skills that employers want. So Absolutely. We're, it's just not right. <laughs> yeah. Do you think? I, I, I know, yeah. you know, it, it, it always... <laughs> It gets me, and, and this is this is even my own kids, and, and you know I've been in the classroom as well, and and when you you ask somebody to to go do some research here, here's a topic, 
go find out about just just you know five minute talking class tomorrow about what you found, and then they come back to you and they say well, we didn't find anything, uh, you know I just didn't buy it. what you didn't find it? there's nothing you can't find information on and good information not just you know the first three sponsored hits on Google but you know really great information from some subject matter expert in somewhere because. It's on the internet. It's the internet, and 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 it, and it drives me mad that students don't have a solid understanding of not just how to search effectively, but then to actually do something effectively with the information they find. It's it's just you know lots of data streams and 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 no ability to to sort them out or or really uh, you know effectively then you know analyze them and turn back to 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 create a product whatever that product might be that's not really even relevant what it is that it, it's um it, it seems to be a nearly universal phenomenon and it's, it's good to hear it's happening in Europe as much as it happens here in the states it really does i mean um, the amount of times that i'd ask a kid you know go and research this and they would generally come back with a printout from wikipedia <laughs> that's not what i asked I ask you to research something, to find out what's true, what's not, and to analyze it. And that's just something they cannot do. So they're used to having everything in front of them. So here we are. Okay, I can search this. Let's do this. Um, but they can't take it a step further. And that's the problem. And it's so important in so many businesses and relevant industries that, you know, you need to be able to take information, you know, whether you're looking at a sales pitch, whether you're starting up your own business, anything like that and they just you can't take it any further than let's do a printout of this let's look at this and it's just it just seems so pointless it, it really does is. it absolutely is and, and i don't know if it goes back to you know the, the way we've been teaching for the last several hundred years uh, where you know here's here's all your information and it's laid out in a textbook or it's it's laid out on a on a, on a chalkboard uh or on a papyrus <laughs> script. Uh, well, you know. that's it. I mean, that's what we're. But we're training kids to do that. That's the problem. So, 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 um, what, so what do we do? Where, where, where do we go? And, and how do we change that mindset? I think we've got to change. I mean, it's a big ask, really, and there's, <laughs> there's no, you know, straight black or white answer to this. But we have to change our own view of what education actually means, because if you train a child to memorize facts in order to pass an exam, then that's what they're going to do. It's simple as that. Right. You know, so unless we change our own view of, right, okay, if a child is able to be spoon-fed these facts, therefore they get this grade on the exam, this means, oh, they must be good. You know, we need to change that in itself. Um, you know, there are several universities in the UK that when it comes to their students, instead of giving them exams, they'll give you, them an oral exam. So they'll ask them to explain about a project or something they've been working on to actually see how they process the information and what conclusions they come to. Now, obviously, that's not going to be, that should be brought down for, you know, kids that are in high school that are just going up, that are looking to enter university. That's the kind of thing we should be doing, not saying, tell me everything you know about religion. It's just not good enough. <laughs> right. right. You know, I, I think it, it goes back to this idea of, of project-based learning. Uh, if you're not applying what you're you're doing, and you don't have an instructor there to kind of guide you through that process, uh, then it's just it's just rote. And uh, you know the, the the best practices that I've seen around this, and, and the 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 teachers who are are the best able to actually have a student understand what's happened, uh, to actually master a concept, are those that are are willing to to get their sleeves up and and do a project with students. I was just on another webcast and I mentioned a, a project that my, my nine-year-old is doing and, 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 I, and I put him at this, this school that he's at for a reason and I pay exorbitant sums to have him educated there for a reason. Uh, is it, because every year they do a deep dive across the curriculum into a, a particular subject. This year is the Middle Ages and uh, and they are they're not just you know studying. You know, this is this is what happened to you know with the Black Plague. Uh, you know, lots of people died. Uh, they're actually uh, you know looking at, at bacteria, for example, or or you know vectors in their their science class, and they are uh, looking at you know the history of the Middle Ages and the growth of uh, Catholicism, and and now they're working. They're the last two months of school. They're writing a play, an original play, and they're going to perform it for the town, and they are. 
and, and the plays that have happened in the past with the school are, are actually really incredible for things that are written by, you know, 9, 10, 11 year olds, um, because they understand. And, and I can have a genuine conversation about the Middle Ages now with my nine year old that I can't with my older children who, you know, made it through, uh, you know, this, this sort of traditional system where they have some vague recollection that the Middle Ages weren't a lot of fun. And <laughs> that's, that's it. You know, it's just really a, a very different thing. And, um, I, I, I can't uh, can't rail on this one enough, but yeah, you know, I, I really uh, I, I thank you for for sharing this with us and and talking about it. Uh, I guess we just keep up with a good fight and and keep uh, beating this into people's heads. But you know, I, I would uh, you know love to see more when when you do stumble across uh, teachers who do it right who make it happen. You know, I'd love to to see some of the success stories as well. Let's so, hope uh, we'll be able to find some. Yeah, yeah, I know. Good luck, right? It's, uh, they're, they're unfortunately few and far between, and uh, it's where, where we need to get to, but we have a ways to go. So Charlie Osborne uh, is with us from uh, from ZDNet and uh, joining us today from 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 London. Uh, thank you so much for your time, and uh, definitely check out her blog. It's it's not just the the rantings of a of a Gen Y uh, by any means. So <laughs> uh, so thank you very much. You're welcome. So last week I had a chance to talk with uh, Richard Byrne of Free Tech for Teachers, and unfortunately we didn't post the interview because, well, I, I recorded it myself and didn't record his audio, which is not terribly useful to any of you guys. So I want to, to actually just recap my favorite of the tools that he shared with us last week, and uh, you should uh, be able to uh, talk with him soon to get some more of his recommendations. Uh, but um, the, the first tool that he recommended, and, and my favorite of, of the ones that he recommended, was called Three Ring. And uh, Three Ring is actually uh, a really, really powerful tool uh, that is uh, that allows you to essentially build portfolios. So if we think about Three Ring, you know, a Three Ring binder, and we're organizing all of our student content, uh, then you know we're putting it into a binder. Okay, and and as a teacher, I always had the best of intentions uh, with uh, you know having you know folders for students and and keeping everything together and and being able to organize. Um, and, and invariably, what I ended up with was was stacks of paper that I, I sometimes had a chance to go through, had trouble providing instant feedback to students, um, and, and certainly nothing that they could then take forward with them as a demonstration of, of mastery or, or of what they're doing. Uh, Three Ring, though, takes your Android or, or iOS phone and uh, allows you to, to just digitize content very, very quickly, and even by just taking a picture of a page that a student has, has created and then putting it into uh, portfolios for your students. Wow, what a great idea, if only. Uh, if only I'd had this when I, when I was in the classroom. Uh, you know, students are, uh, it, basically, all these things get, get just chunked right on into, uh, into folders, really. And um, now on your mobile device, you have uh, access to student portfolios and can, uh, you know, mark them up, can, uh, you know, record work. Um, you know, as, as they, uh, as Three Ring puts it, um, it's a way to maintain a record of work that gets sent home, buried in a backpack, lost in a locker, and so on, uh, and a step towards authentic assessment. And, and again, a just talked with with uh, Vince Leung, uh, mentor model about this this very same idea that we need to be doing a better job of assessment. Filling out multiple choice and true and false exams is hardly a demonstration of mastery, uh, but being able to show students uh, show students work, talk about student projects, and really be able to organize that digitally, uh, and then provide feedback on that. Uh, that's Okay, now we're starting to assess in a, in a way that's reasonable and, and actually will show that a student gets it. Um, you know, already we have uh, exemptions from, you know, the, the national standardized testing for students with special needs who can prepare a portfolio to demonstrate mastery of topics. Um, quite frankly, I can't see why we don't just do that for everybody. Uh, but this is definitely taking us further along. And it, it's, it's becoming the, the rare teacher who doesn't have a, a smartphone in their pocket and can't just snap a picture. Uh, so... Uh, Really, this is this is uh, something something well well worth checking out. Uh, so it's uh, the the it's uh, just three ring dot com t h r e e r i n g dot com uh, apps for both Android and iPhone. Well worth checking out. So um, this was originally shared uh, by Aubrey Waters and then via uh, over on Hack Education and via Richard Byrne uh, last week for our, our ill-fated uh, conversation uh, about these tools. So well worth checking out. 
My second uh, and final tool of the week is Adobe Story. And it's another, another freebie. At least it's free for now. I'm not sure what plans Adobe has to ultimately monetize this. Um, but well worth, well worth checking out. Um, I, I, this, this came to me, I, I was introduced to Story a while back. Uh, by during an Adobe briefing, it was just kind of a uh, an extra thing they they tossed in. Hey, we've got this tool as well. It's in our labs. It's kind of cool. You should check it out. So I did, and really, what it is is a, a digital collaboration tool for for writing sc- screenplays. The idea is that it actually has workflows that integrate with the rest of the Adobe Creative Suite, uh, and so you could write a screenplay, for example, in Story, and then push things right over into Premiere and uh, make use of, uh, you know, use it for for subtitles, for example. Um, but really, it's a, it's a great standalone tool as well, and it allows students to uh, not only organize their own stories and their own thoughts and their own, um, you know, multimedia content and, and, and just the, the way that they... they Kind of work out a story, but allows them to collaborate, and uh, you know through um, through Adobe's uh, you know, online services and hosted services. So uh, this is uh, Adobe Story. If you just Google Adobe Story, that's the easiest. We'll share a link though for it on the the lower third. Um, but it's uh, Adobe Story is this incredibly powerful, rich Air application uh, that is, as I mentioned, is free, but it really is one of the coolest things I've seen for encouraging students not just to write, but write together and come up with a, a, you know, really creative stories. We talk, we're talking already about this idea of authentic assessment uh, and doing something better to assess students than, uh, than just having them take true and false tests. Well, there's probably not many better ways of doing this than, than having them uh, write and film uh, an actual original screenplay. I, I bring this up this week. Uh, Adobe Story has been around for for a little bit. Uh, I bring this up this week though because my my son and I mentioned it. Uh, I think over on on uh, Review Ed, uh, my son is is working on a play with his class, and they're working on a play because in fact this was their year to study across the curriculum of quite deeply the Middle Ages, and so they're writing a play set in the Middle Ages, completely original screenplay. The class is collaborating on it, and they're going to perform them that play later. Uh, at the end of the year for, for our town. Uh, every year, the school does this, and it's brilliant, and the, and the plays are wonderful, and, uh, you know, they, they actually, uh, the school resorts to, you know, really painful, like, hand ways of doing it, and, and just the, the collation of content, and, you know, whiteboards as, as uh, students, you know, really kind of hammer out what, uh, what these plays will look like. Um, but, uh, but I have to say that uh, the... Adobe Story would make this ever so much easier and uh, would allow for, for actually you know, some very cool uh, collaborative development of content. Um, and, and even uh, you know, even for teachers or, or, or you know, people who are, are in the business of, of writing, um, it's actually a really useful tool. And I'm, I'm finding I use it more and more for, for the, the books that I'm developing uh, just for sort of organizing everything and, and helping you know, see, see a flow of a story. So Adobe Story, well worth checking out. All right, and that is it for C12 this week. I uh, hope you've uh, gotten, a, gotten a few stories you can take back and, and consider, talk with your, your peers and your colleagues and your students about, as well as a couple of tools that you can take back into the classroom. Uh, again, thank you to Hello Hello for sponsorship this week, and, uh, and uh, do check us out next week, as well as uh, some related stories over on ReviewEd. Thank you very much. Have a great weekend.